Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with some more Ottoman uh, history. Uh, the, this is the last one of <laughs> the Ottoman series. It's been a long, crazy, fun ride, but we've actually met the last video. Uh, it's actually a fairly new video. I think this got released a couple days ago. Uh, Ottoman Pirates, Armies, and Tactics. So I was actually ready to do something else. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, army armies and tactics. I guess we're kind of just like another like insight, you know, where it's not really it's not really a timeline thing. It's just uh, the tactics of the Ottomans and I guess uh, Ottoman pirates, their armies and tactics. Uh, I mean, pirates are pirates, right? I guess everyone's got their own kind of way of doing things. I'm not sure really what to expect in this video. Um, but yeah, please hit that like and subscribe button below. And yet we're going to jump right into this. Hope you guys are having an amazing day. We've all heard of pirates. In movies and cartoons, the likes of Jack Sparrow, Long John Silver and Captain Flint attack ships, steal treasures, burn... Oh yeah, like if you're looking for a good pirate movie, I guess I said this before in the past, or a pirate movie, but pirate TV series, Black Sails, amazing. Like you know, if you like Black Beer and Long John Silver and that stuff, it's like it's very realistic. Uh, anyways, so yeah, definitely check that out. But anyways, back to the show, Black Sails. Long John Silver and Captain Flint attack ships, steal treasures, burn settlements, and wreak havoc in the oceans. Yet, before this golden age of piracy even began in the 17th century, a fierce battle between government officials and these unruly sea bandits took place in the waters of the Mediterranean. This video is about the main protagonists of this battle, the Ottoman Corsairs, who added a religious flavor to a millennia-long tradition of naval warfare. Okay. When you think about pirates, guns and glory are among the first things that come to mind. And the sponsor of this video, I the game so. called Guns of Glory, is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about an ever served. If you download Guns of Glory now using our link, you'll also see developments in the Mediterranean at the beginning of the 16th century created extremely favorable circumstances for its flourishing. Firstly, two empires rose at both ends of the sea. The Ottomans in the east, who had recently acquired Syria and Egypt in 1517, okay. and the Habsburgs in the west, who managed to unite the crowns of Spain, Sicily, Naples, Milan, Austria and Burgundy under one ruler, Emperor Charles V. Secondly, after the fall of the last Muslim stronghold in Spain in 1492, Moriscos, as the Muslims of that region were called at the time, were forced to choose between conversion to Christianity and expulsion. Some stayed, hoping to secretly cling to their faith, but some moved to nearby North African ports. They did not find a warm welcome from their co-religionists. Unable to blend in with their fellow Muslims, these misfits, familiar with the area's topography as well as Spanish culture and language, would prove themselves ready allies for future Corsair raids. Even worse for the North African Muslims, the Spanish religious zeal was far from quenched. In the first two decades of the 16th century, they started to take control of key ports on the North African coast. This Spanish onslaught at the cost of Muslim powers created an opportunity for countless Ottoman sailors who were lingering in the eastern waters without a means to earn their livelihoods and were uncomfortable with the increasing control of a centralizing Ottoman Empire. They thus started to migrate into the region, where they espoused the holy war against the infidel Habsburgs. At first, there were a number of independent Corsair bands. We know more about the most successful of the lot, the Barbarossa brothers. The duo first operated in Tunis, very close to Habsburg Sicily. Then, invited by a local faction to Algiers, they moved to a base closer to Spain, the Emperor would not take this threat to the heartlands of his empire lightly, and the Habsburgs would briefly manage to dislocate the two brothers from Algiers, killing the elder one, Oruj, in 1518. But the younger brother, Hayreddin, would not only come back and reconquer Algiers, but also undertake successful raids in European waters. 
As he proved his military acumen, not only did other corsairs rally around his flag, but he managed to catch the Sultan Suleiman's eye. As soon as they found themselves in a long and fierce rivalry with Emperor Charles V, the Ottomans realized the I remember him, like I said, he hasn't been in an episode in a while, but those of you who have been watching the series with me, yeah, he's definitely a big factor and definitely a great sea captain. The weakness of their armada. Naval warfare at that time was a costly business. Central governments could not maintain a large fleet for long periods of time unless they were a commercial power, and thus the ships could pay for themselves in peacetime. So when war knocked on the door, what both empires did to put together a powerful navy was to look for contractors. Charles V had solved this problem by employing naval condottieri, including the famous Genoese Andrea Doria. The Ottomans followed suit by resorting to the expertise of these Muslim corsairs who had already proven their worth in the Western Mediterranean. The alliance between the corsairs and the Sublime Port was fruitful for both sides. The former found jobs, as well as lucrative contracts and access to strategic resources such as cannons and timber. The Ottomans, on the other hand, were not only able to threaten the link between Habsburg possessions in Spain and Italy, but also to strike a blow to the prestige of the emperor. Espousing the title Defensor Fide, Defender of the Faith, would mean little if one could not protect his subjects from slavery at the hands of the infidels. At the helm of the Ottoman fleet, Barbarossa and his lieutenants regularly threatened Habsburg coasts in Italy and Spain. Their expertise and leadership brought more than tactical corsair raids, however. In 1538, Barbarossa managed to defeat a Christian fleet led by Doria in the Battle of Previsa, yeah. announcing Ottoman supremacy in the Mediterranean for more than three decades. For the first time in history, the Ottoman fleet would extend its operations to French and Spanish waters. It would spend the winter of 1543-44 in the French port of Toulon, and was a frequent guest in the Tyrrhenian, Ligurian and Balearic seas in the 1550s. A more decisive victory would follow off the Tunisian coasts in the Battle of Jeba in 1560, where the Ottoman fleet caught the Habsburg one unawares and annihilated it. Armed with new allies and eager to further invest in a naval confrontation with their nemesis, the Ottomans extended their dominion in North Africa as well. They conquered Tripoli from the hands of a rival Corsair group the Maltese Knights of St. John in 1551. Tunis would follow in 1574. After that date, these three port cities, Algiers, Tripoli and Tunis, would appear as the capitals of the three Barbary Regencies until they were conquered by the Europeans in the 19th and 20th centuries. The link between the Corsairs and Istanbul gradually weakened towards the end of the 16th century as the Ottomans came to an uneasy truce with the Habsburgs, and a long war with Persia reduced their willingness to allocate more resources for their navy. This gradual detachment meant autonomy for the three regencies that started to conduct their own foreign policy. They would sign separate diplomatic treaties with European powers, if not all, at least some of them, trying to make sure that all of them were not united against themselves at the same time. This time period, between 1580 and 1640, would be considered the golden age of Ottoman Corsairs. Disrupted by internal strife, economic crises, ecological challenges, and the Europe-wide Thirty Years' War, Christian central governments were unable to put... And I've done the Thirty Years' War, definitely check it out. <laughs> Great opportunity, opportunity to, yeah. Europe-wide Thirty Years' War Christian central governments were unable to put together a functioning fleet in the Mediterranean. This would change in the second half of the 17th century, however, as capital started to recover and created effective central governments with improved financial and military capabilities. Newly designed warships, equipped with more powerful and more numerous cannons, would start to pressurize the Corsairs. On more than one occasion, European armadas turned their cannons to major Corsair ports, 
and demanded that their ships and subjects not be molested. Although this strong arming was not a long-term solution, it was enough to announce the end of the Corsair ascendancy. The 18th century would even be a much less happy one, as navies under central governments featured larger and more powerful warships, revenues from Corsair operations steadily dwindled. In the 19th century, Muslim Corsairs would be forced to obey the rules of a newly emerging international law, and Algiers, the most powerful of Corsair capitals, would be captured by the French in 1830, to be followed by Tunis in 1881 and Tripoli in 1912. We already mentioned that Mediterranean piracy had a religious element as well. Yet this should not obscure the fact that the Corsair milieu was a highly cosmopolitan one, including people from all corners of the Mediterranean and even further beyond. Just to give an idea, according to the Spanish captive Antonio Sosa, out of 35 captains operating in Algiers in 1581, only 13 were Muslims and the rest were Christian converts, coming from Spain, Italy, France, Albania, Greece and Hungary. Oh, wow. Surprisingly for that period, there was even one former Jew among them. The shift from oared vessels to sails in the next century would replace those Mediterranean renegades with their northern brethren. But the predominance of converts was obvious. A Dutch report notes that out of 54 captains operating in Algiers in 1625-26, to 26, 24 were former Christians from France, England, Portugal, Spain, the Low Countries, Greece, Poland, Denmark, Germany, Frisia, and Valonia. Okay, well. The fact that one is a recent convert does not preclude the possibility that his actions were driven by religious zeal. To prove that they were not, one has to look for other evidence. First of all, the Holy Inquisition's records tell us that most of the renegade corsairs who chose Islam over Christianity were unaware of even the most basic tenets of their new religion. Moreover, we know how they maintained active ties with their families, inviting their siblings and children to their side, and even anchoring in the ports of their fatherlands. In one such instance in 1623, facing a storm, the Dutch renegade Little Murad Rees, also known as Jan Jansun, took refuge in Vera, where his crew met with their families. Two years later, he would spend the winter with his three ships in Amsterdam. Although okay. the Treaty of 1622 obliged the Dutch to give them shelter and provision, the existence of Christian slaves on board would cause some diplomatic problems. In spite of religious differences that contemporary sources tended to emphasize so much, there was also a sense of camaraderie among the sailors at that time, even between Muslim corsairs and their nemesis, the Knights of St. John. Although occasionally at each other's throats, these hardened sea fighters respected each other and considered their employers in imperial capitals as effeminate cowards. They were also aware that they needed each other in order to squeeze money from central governments. Finally, as piracy was a more financial than a... That's great. I mean, they hate each other, but well, at least they know they kind of need each other as well. Because... They hate each other, but they hate the governments more, and they, they need to get you know get the money out of these governments as much as they can, uh, and yeah, if they kind of need the help from their uh, their enemies. I don't know. This guy just seems kind of funny. Money from central governments. Finally, as piracy was a more financial than a political or religious undertaking, corsairs tended to evade each other if they could, attacking a defenseless merchant ship would be safer and more lucrative than facing a mighty opponent. The right, they're just looking for like easy pickings, you know, they don't want the bloodshed, they don't like, because you go into war, like manpower is money, and then you don't want to fix your boat and all this stuff, because that's money, and you want to gain money, you not have to, you know, lose money I man you because you might get in a war you might win the battle but then what you won you know might not be as much as you just lost you know but i don't know camaraderie amongst thieves right would be safer and more lucrative than facing a mighty opponent the religious side of the warfare in the mediterranean led many historians into considering pirates as mere political tools and neglecting the economic rationale of their activities 
In fact, as the Catalan historian Gonzalo Tolopez Nadal insisted, piracy was an alternative form of trade. While strong economies had a vested interest in proper ways of conducting honest trade, weaker actors who found themselves excluded from lucrative trade routes tried to fight back by breaking the rules. When they could, as was the case with Tunis during the Napoleonic Wars, they would switch back to trade as soon as possible. But in general, the Corsairs were unable to directly participate in international trade on equal footing, and thus were forced to cheat in order to survive. There were a number of reasons why Muslim ports were inferior economic and trade centers. First of all, as John Pryor noted, trunk trade routes in the Mediterranean were passing from the north, along the Spanish, French and Italian coasts. Oh. Peripheral North African port cities were at a disadvantage vis-à-vis -vis northern ports such as Barcelona, Marseille and Genoa. Secondly, major winds were blowing from northwest and northeast. This means if a ship sailing in Spanish, Italian or French waters was caught by it, it would only be driven offshore and find itself in the middle of the sea. But the effect of the same northerly winds could be devastating for ships sailing along North Africa. They would be driven ashore and wrecked. The oh, third okay. reason was that the North African coasts were full of shallows, shoals, reefs and offshore islands, and there were few natural anchorages providing deep safe waters. In short, it was extremely unsafe to sail there. In fact, the entire coast from Setua to Cape Bon was a graveyard for ships since antiquity. Fourthly, Oh well, yeah, 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 it makes sense. I mean, like the pirates, you know, I mean, they're not getting part of this awesome trade and they're being neglected kind of down here. Uh, not necessarily because people don't want to trade with them. It's just, you know, geography and whatnot. Uh, so, yeah, it makes sense. They're like, you know, we can't make a living down here, so we're going to go steal, you know, the money you guys are making. I get it. Most of the port cities in North Africa were surrounded by deserts with scattered pockets of productive land. In other words, they were lacking hinterlands that could support a vibrant market economy and a shipbuilding industry. The lack of basic raw materials such as timber was one of the reasons why Algerian corsairs could never totally break free from the Ottomans until the very end. Finally, Europeans were extremely reluctant to let Muslims participate in those trade routes. In spite of the fact capitulations gave trading rights to Muslim merchants, in practice they did everything to protect their trade from outside competition. It was not only ports that were pushed to piracy because of economic marginalization. Most of the Corsairs were landless peasants who were ready to risk their lives in order to make a living because there was no other alternative. This is why French... Well, I, they, might, they might be about to tell me, but is this what, like, you know, the, what would they do, you know, if the Muslims are up there, you know, Corsairs, and they're trying to like, conduct trade or whatnot, because apparently the Christians were kind of trying to prevent that. Would they attack them or whatnot, or just wouldn't let them, like, come to port, you know, or they would just, or, like, the deals, they, they just wouldn't deal, give them the same kind of price or rates as they would, like, their Christian allies, that kind of thing, they would kind of rip them off. Historian Fernand Braudel considered brigandage and piracy as siblings, and this is why they were occasionally called sea bandits by modern historians. The problem of finding a means of living was further exacerbated by the constant... Or I guess they had a bad reputation, they didn't want to deal with them because they're afraid they're going to get robbed, you know, because of just a bad reputation. The problem of finding a means of living was further exacerbated by the constant population increase in the 16th century. Of course, most of the Europeans who ended up in North Africa did not come voluntarily. They were mostly caught and enslaved in one of the thousands of Corsair raids along the European coasts. Wow. Sneakily approaching their target at dusk, Corsairs would descend on those villages at once, looting and catching helpless people who could scarcely understand what was going on. They would then round up those who could not make a hasty retreat to a safe place, such as a nearby fort or mountain. The next step would be to carefully examine their body and leave the elderly and the children as they could not be put to work. Laden with booty and slaves, they would set sail for home, where they expected to make a quick profit at the marketplace. Such coastal raids can sometimes be as large and complicated as proper naval operations. 
In the heyday of Corsair activities, combined fleets sometimes stayed on land for days and extended their operation inland by tens of miles. Central governments struggled to find enough money and men to guard their coasts. They built numerous watchtowers along the shores, some of which still stand today, but most of these efforts produced mediocre results, as swift Corsairs successfully used the element of surprise. Each campaigning season, thousands of Europeans were taken into captivity and found themselves on the other side of the Mediterranean, either to work in households, Corsair ships, or public works, or, if they had any, wait for their rich relatives to send ransom money. I think of kind of like the similar thing to like, you know, oh, if whoever the British or whoever was, I'm not saying British, but whoever was taking the slaves, uh, from the African coast and bring them to the Americas kind of thing, you know, just like randomly going in there, get them up and taken off kind of thing. Is that the similar kind of concept, right? I don't know. Maybe you guys let me know. In time, these slaves would blend in with the local population, some reneging their religion and joining with the Corsairs and inflicting the same fate that they had once suffered upon their former brethren. It was one thing to steal something and another to sell it. European governments may not have been able to locate and punish pirates on the sea, but they could pressurize political authorities who allowed them to use their facilities, resources, ah. and marketplaces. European states concluded treaties that sought to protect the rights of their merchants, first with Istanbul, and when the Ottomans proved unable to control their vassals, with North African authorities. Whenever there was a transgression, Diplomats intervened on behalf of compatriots and sought compensation and redress. It was not seldom that Corsair captains were punished by local authorities who did not want to antagonize European states with which they had a treaty. Thus, Corsairs could not behave as they pleased and had to. F yeah, I mean, you, if you the place you're normally used to trading, if they outlaw, you know, s slaves, then you're that, that part of your business, you're out of luck. And so you then you have to either find a different place to trade your slaves or you got to find something different to trade with, right? To follow certain rules. In fact, Mediterranean piracy was a highly regulated, complex affair. It was respect for long established rules and customs that differentiated corsairs from lawless pirates. These rules and customs required that both Corsair and trade ships carry a number of official documents. First of all, captains needed authorization from local authorities in order to legally engage in piracy. After proving their skills and trustworthiness in front of a jury composed of senior captains, they were given license to officially set sail and issued a letter of mark or letter of reprisal that contained specific instructions. Before leaving the port, they acquired two more documents this time from the consuls of European powers that were at peace with their government. The first was a passport, including the name and type of the ship, as well as the number of cannons it carried. Corsairs were supposed to show this to that country's officers so that they leave them alone, and even help them, as they should do as long as the Corsairs abide by international treaties. The second document taken from the European consuls was a copy of the patent that trade ships were carrying in order to identify themselves. In the middle of the sea, it was hard for European ships to prove their identity, so they had to carry a document issued by their governments. This document, called patente or congé, included the name of the captain and the owner, the port of departure and arrival, the cargo manifest, a serial number, as well as a date of preparation and expiration. As most Corsairs did not know how to read and write, they would use the copy that they took from the consul in order to check whether this patent was authentic or not. Sometimes they counted the words or the lines, at others they matched the borders and framings. In order to facilitate the verification process, governments issued patents with notches, the upper given to the Corsairs and the lower to their ship captains. Corsairs would match their upper half with the lower half at the disposal of the trade ship's captain. When sighted by a Corsair ship, the captain should allow them to come aboard and show him his papers. If the European ship was not carrying a flag, or if the captain refused to allow the Corsairs aboard or fired the first shot, it would amount to forfeiting his rights under international law. His ship would be bon prise, as the French would say, or fair game, as we would today. 
If he complied, he would invite on board a party of inspection, generally consisting of 10 to 15 people, and these would check his documents and goods. Corsairs were supposed to leave his ships unharmed if everything was in order. They could only confiscate the goods if there were any belonging to traders from other nations uncovered by international treaties. Wow. An interesting detail showing the thoroughness of the regulations is that the Corsairs were obligated to pay the freight of the impounded goods so that the captain, unable to make the delivery, would not have to restitute the money out of his own pocket. Everything was fine in theory, yet in practice things often went awry. Yeah. The aforementioned inspection procedure was wrought with ambiguities and open to abuse. European sources prefer I'm going to say, like, you're pirates, but yet you're not pirates because you're employed by a government. So is it really piracy if your government supports it and whatnot? You know, you're signed off, you're given the rights to do so. And the fact that, like, you, know, you get, you know, you're people to board a ship, you know, to see if, you know, these these things matched up, you know, if, we were, if they were allowed to or whatnot with the paperwork. I'm just like, there's no way all this went according to plan. Like, I, I can see it. I bet that rarely happened where things went without like a, without a notch. Everything was just oh, it's fine and dandy. Okay, your your things work out on your way. Uh, I doubt that. I mean, things definitely got abused, and I, things definitely had to have gone south, you know, in a lot of these transactions. But it blows my mind how they're still considered pirates yet they have the government. You know, if your government says sure, you're allowed to go in, you know, that would be a uh, Go be pirate. You're only allowed to basically uh, attack these certain ships or these certain ports, and blah blah blah. Like that's is that really considered a pirate? It's more like part of the navy or something. Like I don't know. That's definitely very interesting, right there. <laughs> Provide several examples where corsairs tried to cheat by beating up the crew in order to force them to confess that there were passengers and goods belonging to other nationalities on board, wow. or that the ship had previously engaged in piracy and attacked Muslim ships. Still, European captains engaged in similar acts. As most sources at our disposal come from Europe, it is hard to say Corsairs cheated more than their Christian colleagues in this regard. Right, you gotta, you gotta look at where you're getting your information from. So obviously, it's gonna be pretty one-sided, you know, depending on whose side you get your information on. So yeah, take it with a grain of salt, right? This script was written by a brilliant Turkish historian, Emre Safa Gurkan whose highly recommended title, called Sultan's Corsairs, will be possible to find in English in the near future. Okay. Wow. Uh, pretty much that was like half, like, a throwback. First half was like kind of going over, like, past stuff we've already seen in this series. The second half was pretty much the tactics of what was going on with, you know, piracy and stuff like that. Uh, but... Uh, so, like the first half, you kind of you kind of already knew what was going on with the names and all that stuff. So, pretty much knew the first half, kind of what was what was happening. The second half was pretty much all the tactics and everything, which was the part I found the most fascinating. Was the second half of this uh, definitely really cool? Like, like I said, the, the contracts and the government that just stuff was mind blowing. I thought that was really neat, really fascinating, and yeah. Uh, you know, each side took advantage of this stuff. And, you know, I think it's more of like, you know, the governments, the governments didn't want to get in trouble, you know, that much. So they kind of gave them these guidelines and things they're supposed to do. And they probably didn't really expect, you know, these pirates to kind of be a hundred percent all for that. They kind of probably just turned a blind eye towards it, you know, and hopefully, you know, Someone didn't complain about it. I don't know. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe, subscribe button below. Catch you guys in future videos. Always a blast. And this is the last one of the Ottomans. There we go, guys. Peace. See you guys in future videos. Awesome series.